Released in 2013, this documentary looked at the sex trafficking business from various angles. It is an old documentary considering the fact that it was released in 2013, but also considering the fact that it's talking about sex trafficking and the fact that sex trafficking is still a problem the world over. It's still a viable and necessary conversation, and the documentary is a good segue into that conversation. In this episode of Lessons from the Screen, we are going to be going into Tricked, the documentary that talks about sex trafficking in America. We're going to be diving into this documentary. We're going to be having a conversation about sex trafficking in general. And we're going to be letting you know if this documentary is something that you should add to your toolkit. Lessons from the screen, what we mean is we go through Different documentaries to tell you what they gon' do Give you our lessons, give them our blessings If they trash, we tell you, there is no second guessing Knowledge is power, but time is precious And we're here to keep you from them Lessons, so sit back as we grew Giving you the review, so you only spend time on the docs that you need to Welcome to another episode of Lessons from the Screen The show where we give you a review of whether or not a show or information, article Whatever you can watch from any particular particular screen of any kind is worth your time we waste our time our energy and our brain power so that you don't have to lessons from the screen is sponsored by pax inc that's p-a-c-t-s-i-n-c go to the website www.p-a-c-t-s-i-n-c.org paxinc.org leave a review leave a comment pax inc is a black activist advocacy and think tank with the purpose of increasing the quality of life for black people in america through education and a culture shift like I said before, and like I say every show, head to the website, read up, plenty of information there, donate, become a member, take a survey, tell a friend to tell a friend, do whatever you can to help them because they're doing whatever they can to help you. So the documentary had a very inflammatory opening for some people. Uh, with a pimp saying that all women are either prostitutes or whores. According to this man, the definition of a prostitute is someone that sells pussy for money. The definition of a whore is someone who gives pussy away for free. So by his estimation and calculations, all women do one of the two. So they're all either a prostitute or a whore. Now, this documentary is a narrative-driven documentary. It's all about the stories. It's not about the facts. It's not. I'm sorry, not the facts, because everyone's given their story. It's not about the statistics. It's not about the figures. It's not about the general statements or even really about uh, finding some sort of central truth. It's about the narratives that are presented and the people that are presenting them, and it's really relying on its ability to connect with you as an audience member and 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 your ability to connect with the people telling their stories on the screen so they travel to different locations to talk about law enforcement and how they're going about sex trafficking and combating sex trafficking in their areas uh, but the the do- the documentary does start from a very naive place with the mention that it was believed that there was a business partnership between pimps and prostitutes. And this was stated by one of the law enforcement officers that they spoke with. And it also first presents the image of a self-described good guy pimp. So the very first guy they show you in the documentary is a pimp. But unless you're familiar, you probably would miss the fact that he's a pimp. Although I'm sure what he says would probably clue most people in. But the very first time you see a pimp in action is a guy who is a self-described good guy pimp with his his girl, one of his girls, I'm assuming, unless she was the only girl next to him. Now, an interesting name or interesting little tidbit that I found here is watching the documentary. There's a point where they're sharing a story because that is a narrative driven documentary. And 
they bleep out the names of one of the girls. But I watch everything with caption on for multiple reasons. But anyway, so I was watching this with captions on and the name was still in the caption. So they bleeped it out of the story, but they left it in the caption, which that's neither here nor there in terms of the quality of the documentary. But I thought it was interesting. Um, and it did speak to maybe how thorough somebody was and making sure that everything was was working together and going hand in hand. It was a bit of of uh, disjointedness in that component. And that's something that, you know, would become kind of a quality of the documentary itself. Uh, it talked about law enforcement, prostitutes, pimps. Everyone had their angle, including the Johns, the guys that actually utilized the services of prostitutes. They spoke to two of them who were very open and honest and cool with the fact that they did it and they saw it as a regular part of human existence. They also spoke to the lady who makes those infamous pimp cups that everybody in the black community, I'm sure most of us in the black community, we're familiar with the pimp cups. Uh, but she seemed pretty devoutly Christian, which was a bit of a surprise, although it shouldn't be thinking back on it, but it was. But she was saying that she places holy oil on each cup after it's made, and she sits it on an altar for seven days, and she prays over the cup for the pimps and the people in that lifestyle. She also said that she prays for the girls and somewhat defended the career choice of the pimps as pimps. Now, the player's ball was also mentioned. Again, most of us in the black community, I'm sure, are familiar with the player's ball especially those of us that watch black movies because the players club and we had a lot of movies come out in our community that talked about showcased and kind of kind of glorified the players ball uh, not to mention some of our favorite characters and comedians coming up playing pimps so it's, it's not something that we're not used to seeing or it's not something that we're uninformed or naive about even if we might be a tad bit naive about the level of violence prevalent in that line of work in that industry now it also talked about escort services the mistreatment of the women and it talked about the stereotypes that these women face and the difficulty of bringing cases to trial because the primary witnesses would be prostitutes and prostitutes are seen as less than credible witnesses uh, because in addition to being victims they're also criminals because prostitution is illegal so all in all it, it covered its bases and it tried to be balanced and it gives you it does give you things to talk about now one of the obvious things that it gives you to talk about is that pimping is still around. It's still a thing. It's still happening. And I know this documentary is five years old, but it hasn't gone anywhere in five years. As a matter of fact, there have been a lot of cities, towns, municipalities that have talked about opening up red light districts. And this was something that was highlighted a bit at the end of the documentary. But it's something that's still being discussed in various places. The opening of red light districts where people would be free to facilitate sex services and the government would tax those services and make some of that money because there are billions of dollars flowing through the sex industry right now but there is a a a, a kind of underguided or a kind of a understanding happening especially when you talk to young people that pimping isn't a thing anymore. Like that was like some 70s, 80s, 90s thing, but nobody really does it anymore. You know, this idea that uh, most of the women that are involved in when you hear the term sex trafficking and, 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 and all of these things of that nature, you're not necessarily thinking about the standard relationship of a pimp and a prostitute. In fact, a good chunk of people believe that all of the prostitutes now are out there of their own accord. There's no such thing as a pimp anymore. So it's important that we remind people that pimping is still a thing. It's still out there. It's still happening. It's also important to remind people that 
sex trafficking and prostitution is not always a woman making a decision to be a prostitute. Sometimes this woman has been kidnapped, she has been coerced, she has been lured, and she is being manipulated or she is being held against her wishes. So those things need to constantly be reinforced. Another thing it gives us to talk about is the fact that that lifestyle is still looked up to. If you listen to modern rap songs, the, 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 the common course of the lyrics still haven't changed. And talking about the impact of music on a culture is a show that we need to have because I think that it's one that's either extremely overestimated and over-exaggerated or it, music's effect on a culture is, is, is downplayed to the point of people wanting to say it has no impact at all. And so that's that's something that we need to hash out as well. But the fact is, even myself as a young a young black male growing up, I and everybody I knew to an extent looked up to that culture, the dress, the money, the cars, the jewels, the women. You know, those guys were alpha males and they had it all. And most of us young people look growing up, especially as young males growing up, especially when you go through puberty, you want the girls, you know, like that's thing number one. Like you don't, you know, you want a girl. You don't care too much about nothing else. You want a girl. And so the guys that get the girls are the guys that you look up to and who growing up in the hood and the ghettos and whatnot, who have more girls than the pimps? Nobody. Matter of fact, even if you weren't a pimp, if you had a bunch of girls, you became a pimp by default. Like, people just call you a pimp. So, even to that, there was this misunderstanding about what a pimp was. Because growing up, a pimp was just a dude with a lot of girls. We didn't think about the fact that he was making these women sell their bodies. Or the fact that he might get violent with these women. Or the fact that, you know, he was holding some of these women hostage. And I'm not saying that's the case in every situation. But... That wasn't even something that came into our minds. What came into our minds when we thought about pimps was fly clothes, fly girls, fly jewelry, and fly cars. And what teenage boy that's going through puberty and raging hormones isn't thinking about one of those things, if not all of them. Cars, jewelry, clothes, or girls. And usually not even clothes and jewelry for their own sake. You want clothes and jewelry because it helps you get the girls. Now, you might want a car for the sake of having a car. But for most people, you want a girl. The other three things just help you get girls. So, and even that component was speaking, spoken of by one of the, the pimps in the documentary, the fact that girls are attracted to that, that, that status, that alpha male look, that alpha male status, the, the flash, the bling. The types of, there are a lot of young girls that are attracted to those things, and a lot of more mature women are as well. They've just learned how to, how to, how to see things for what they are, and they've learned how to take a step back, which is, you know, some of that important wisdom that all older people try to pour into younger people when they get a chance, but that younger people seldom listen to. So, We've got to do something to make it less looked up to in our community, especially because I still talk to, you know, I still see fathers talking to their teenage sons and two girls are called a house. And, you know, a father, you know, will compliment his son by saying, boy, you, well, you a pimp. Why are you out there doing it? You know, and they get excited about it. And that that can't be a good thing in the community because pimps aren't anything to look up to. And we have a similar problem with the way we look up, the way kids look up the drug dealers, not necessarily adults. It's not the exact same as with pimps, but it, it's a similar situation with the way uh, poor kids and impoverished communities look up the drug dealers because they have the money and they usually have the girls too. The other thing that has to be taken into account is the range of girls that are being captured. And this was something that the documentary did a decent job of illustrating. The range is expanding. It used to be runaways and people with nowhere to go or no one, nowhere to go and no one to talk to, no one that would care about them. Now it's becoming something where the girls are being lured. Girls with family and friends and support are being lured away from all of those things. And then once they're out in the dark, they're being trapped. 
And they're in a world that they're just not familiar with. They don't know how to maneuver in. So this means that you can't just say she was taken and became a prostitute because she didn't have a daddy. You know, that used to be a common thing when I was growing up. Well, all our girls are getting this because they ain't got daddies. Well, nowadays, there are a lot of girls with daddies that are being captured. So we have to open up and have these conversations with our children about how to deal with these situations where you are lured from your safety net. And it also means we have to acknowledge the fact that sheltering kids nowadays is, is, is probably even more detrimental nowadays than it has been historically. Because the level of things that are out to get them and the way that they're out to get them nowadays, if you shelter your kid and they have no idea of what's out there, they're more likely to get caught up in something that is extremely nasty because the world is a lot nastier nowadays than it was in the past. There are diseases out there. there there's medicine that can maintain you from situations that you couldn't be maintained from before. There are, there are various different emotional ways to destroy somebody uh, different ways to manipulate somebody ways to traumatize somebody for the entirety of their lives and with the internet you can't even get away from the trauma because it's always there the internet you know the internet doesn't delete anything it's all stored and everyone can have access to it so that adds it, its own psychological horror to the equation we this is something that we we can't shield our girls from or our children from our boys from any longer and one other thing that i want to mention that that needs to be a takeaway that can be that definitely needs to be talked about is that it's not just girls yeah it's primarily girls for sure and the, the pimps are primarily men for sure but if we want to solve this problem we have to solve it holistically that means we have to look at the root of the problem and not look at it from a gender-based perspective, but look at it as it is. That means we can't ignore the little boys who are in this world, either being sexually trafficked themselves, or were born into the world and are being groomed to be the next, the next generation of pimps. We can't ignore these, these boys. Even if they escape, boys that are brought up in this world are more likely to become an active participant in it. And we also have to acknowledge nowadays that women are pimps as well. I was watching a documentary about five or six years ago that I'll see if I can find about the players ball and about women coming to the players ball as pimps and about women wanting to break into that industry, wanting to break into that sector, as they call it, and wanting to be seen as being on equal footing as the men in terms of their, their pimping and their game. So the conversation has to expand in terms of who we see as victims and in terms of who we see as perpetrators. The flow of the documentary seemed disconnected or jumbled, if you will. They also failed to really talk about the full scope of sex workers. I have met prostitutes that don't have a pimp and do it because they choose to and they are content knowing that that's what they do they could get another job but they feel like the money they make makes it worth it now i can acknowledge that these women are more than likely in the minority of women in this situation definitely and i can also acknowledge that these women are still probably negatively impacted in some way by the decision but I can still acknowledge that it is their decision and they're not trapped there by some other person against their will. And those women still deserve a voice at the table. And that doesn't ruin anybody's argument by allowing these women to speak on their perspective and their experiences and what they think. It doesn't, it doesn't discount or remove any validity from any other argument that can be made but it allows us to have a more accurate discussion on these particular topics also it seems interesting that all of the pimps in this documentary were black until the very very end they showed a i'm assuming he was a white pimp 
but all the pimps that they mentioned were black and all of the prostitutes that have a voice are non-black. Now, the black girls that they did talk to, of which there was really only two, but the black girls that they did talk to, they weren't really interviewed. Essentially, they just talked during the interview with a pimp. And these women also seem to present an image of being okay with their situation, which actually goes directly against the message of the documentary and in my opinion it presents it furthers the image the stereotype that black women are okay with being prostitutes with being taken advantage of with being, with selling their bodies for money and that black men are predators now i know people are going to argue that one way or another but when you watch the documentary for me anyways that was glaring that all of the prostitutes that they talked to that were talking about how horrible the situation was and that had any extended voice whatsoever, none of them were black. Now, for a country that, for a society that believes that any black woman you see walking down the street is a prostitute, it seems interesting to me that you would have a documentary on prostitution, a documentary on prostitution and not have black women at least one or two that have a prominent voice in the documentary. Every single person that they that that had an extended voice that was a female was not black. So you know that that to me was glaring. I just I couldn't get past that. It was it was glaring and obvious. Uh, there were also random stories of arrest that didn't go anywhere. Some guy saying he wasn't a pimp being arrested by the police who were calling him a pimp. And then the documentary moves on without really giving you any information about what happened with that case or what evidence they have to say that he really is a pimp. So, and that was especially interesting in one example because the woman he was, the women he, were, he was accused of pimping came out and said he wasn't their pimp even after he was in custody and on trial and still there was no evidence presented to 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 allow us there wasn't even really adequate explanation of the case to allow us as viewers to understand what was going on with this guy outside of them telling us that he was a pimp and then trying to showcase the women as being brainwashed women. But they didn't even really do that because they didn't really talk about those particular women and how they might have been psychologically held by this man. And even though in this one case that I'm mentioning, at the very end, they finally did, come as the credits were rolling, talk about how one of the women did say that he was a pimp. She flipped and he accepted a 15-year plea deal out of the five or six people that they showed being arrested, that was the only story with a conclusion presented. Everything else was just kind of, we're arresting the guy, he's a pimp, all right, next story. But like, okay, so what's going on? How do you know? Outside of the, you know, the one John that they got, they caught him in a sting where an undercover police officer was pretending to be a pimp. Of which I have a problem with that as well, because an argument could be made that if the police officers had not presented themselves in order to in order to give him the opportunity to commit the crime, who's to say an opportunity would have presented itself for him to commit the crime anyways? And so in some cases, I do understand why they do it, but in other cases, I I, it seems more like entrapment, more like a situation where they're doing more harm than good. So in that, I'm not and I'm not necessarily saying that about this case. I'm just saying in general, I tend to have a problem with that that method of catching criminals, of pretending to be something. That, you know, if it's something to deal with minor or something like that, you know, whatever. But in a lot of situations where you see these types of tactics being used where the cops will put something out or they'll they'll basically set up a trap and then see who bites 
You know, I don't I don't like those tactics because in a lot of cases you might be dealing with somebody that's desperate, that's not necessarily thinking about things clearly, that's not necessarily in their right state of mind, and they might do something that had you not provided the opportunity, they might not have gone through because they might not have had the opportunity, and then maybe something would have happened where they would have restored themselves or they would have uh, rethought about it or repositioned themselves and not gone through with it anyways. But you remove that opportunity from them because you presented the opportunity for them to trap themselves and then you trap them before you know they even had a chance to rethink the position i know a lot of people are going to argue about that and i'm not necessarily doing a great job of explaining my point here but it is what it is they did produce a few statistics at the tail end of the documentary about the numbers but the caveat to those numbers especially the one regarding modern day slavery and this this thing that there are more people enslaved today than at any point in human history stats like that bother me those types of holistic general population raw stats because there are more people alive today than at any point in human history and the amount of people that there are alive today is just so much greater than the amount of people that have ever existed at any one point in time in, in global history, world history, that there's bound to be more of literally everything than there were back then. So there's bound to be more criminals. There's bound to be uh, more scholars. There's bound to be more discoveries. There's bound to be more of all kinds of things happening nowadays just because there are so many more people and so no one takes into account the major population booms the major the modern advances in technology and medicine that have increased our quality of life and life expectancy nobody thinks about these things or maybe they do and they just don't care they're being lazy i'm not sure which one it is but those statistics like that are absolutely broken to me it would be a more viable statistic to talk about uh, percentage-based numbers. That way you you have an act, adequate and balanced comparison, but people don't seem to want to do that for whatever reason. So, and I think one of the reasons is because the, the, the percentages don't present the same shock value as the raw number. You see this with the imprisonment numbers. When well, somebody says there are more people in prison today than there were enslaved in the in the 1850s that has a certain shock value to it but when you tell that same person well uh there were only 25 million people in america back then in 1850 there's more black people in america nearly two times as many black people in america right now as there were people in america period in 1850 so when you tell people that you know it's like okay it kind of breaks the, the the narrative of that statistic but if you go percentage base and say that less than five percent of the total population makes up you know more than more than 30 percent of the inmates now that still has a shock value and it has a ring to it but to come up with that statistic it takes a little bit more creativity and a little bit more forethought. And it, it still isn't quite as shocking as the raw number one. But that's neither here nor there. That's me again going on my pet peeve. I don't really like narrative driven documentaries because unless they present statistics and a holistic view, for me, they're usually emotional propaganda pieces. And this one tried to be that. It did try to present some statistics. It presented one or two at the end. And it tried to have a balanced perspective in allowing the pimps to talk and this, that, and the third. But it was still missing a component of a prostitute voice. And so it was also still very much disjointed. So overall, I give it a two stars. I give it two stars. It's not the worst. But it definitely could have been a lot better. And with that, I will see you guys next time on the next episode of Lessons from the Screen. Lessons from the Screen, what we mean is we go through different documentaries to tell you what they gon' do. Give you our lessons, give them our blessings.
if they trap me, tell you there is no second guessing. Knowledge is power, but time is precious. And we're here to keep you from them. So sit back as we groove, giving you the review. So you only spend time on the dots that you need to. I want to thank you guys once again for tuning in to Lessons from the Screen. I also want to encourage you guys to head over to the website, www.freedomtrainnetwork.com. You can head over there to the website, gain access to all of the shows on the Freedom Train Network, including this one. Uh, you can access to old shows, new shows. You should also check out the Freedom Train app. You can find it in the Google Play Store if you research Google Play or research Freedom Train Radio or Freedom Train Presents or Freedom Train Network. You'll find the app there and you'll see the Choo Choo Train. That is our trademark choo-choo train for the Freedom Train. You can get all of the shows right there on your cell phone. Notification whenever we drop anything or maybe we just want to see the notification saying hi. So you should definitely go and get that app. Uh, and you should also take a listen to our live internet radio streams throughout the weekend. We're dropping lectures. We're dropping shows. We're dropping all kinds of interesting things on the weekends. So definitely take advantage of that. I want to thank you guys again for supporting us. And as always, as always, we appreciate you. We will see you next week. This is the Freedom Train Network presents Lessons from the Screen. <laughs>